Hello, and a big welcome to everyone for, to this session at the ESRC Festival of Social Science, um, both the support, um, partnership with, between SAGE and the Campaign for Social Science bringing together our um, session this evening. Um, it's fantastic to see you here, and I'm really excited about the panel that we have lined up for you this evening. On a day um, when I guess understanding our social world couldn't feel more urgent, we will hopefully be optimistically talking about an exciting new branch of social research that's using big data to understand our social world. I wanted to start by um, sharing a story. I have a sister called Rachel, and about seven months ago, Rachel gave me a call and she, in fits of ecstasy, saying, um, asking me whether I was pregnant. And as you can see, she, she got it right. She, Rachel had just logged on to Facebook and had been greeted by an advert congratulating her on imminently becoming the funnest aunt in the world ever. Um, so luckily, Rachel didn't find out this news before I did, but um, and happily, she's um, been determined to fulfil the prophecy of the advert with um, buying many fun presents and being potentially even more excited about the arrival of this baby than I am. <laughs> But um, I think the story is sort of illustrative of the reality that we live in um, a world where we're leaving behind digital breadcrumbs for increasingly intelligent machines to collect, to interpret and make use and make predictions. In the past two years, over 90% of the world's data has been created. The digital breadcrumbs produced by us all as we go about our daily lives contain huge potential, not just for commercial organisations looking for ad revenue, but also um, for social research. These vast data sets offer new ways to understand our world and look to solve societal problems. The capacity to collect and analyse massive data sets has already transformed fields such as biology, astronomy and physics, but the social sciences have been comparatively slower to adapt. There are many hurdles and barriers facing social researchers as they begin to engage with big data, not least questions around representation and bias in secondary data sets, as well as questions around privacy and informed consent. Um, and um, that require us to develop and think about new ethical frameworks for our research. New tools are needed, so much of the data we're talking about is produced in real time, and as well as being vast in terms of quantity, is also vast in terms of the array of different sources that are available to be analysed. We're often talking about unstructured text and require new approaches to bring together both qualitative and quantitative research skills to analyse that. Despite these challenges, Sage, we feel um, that the social sciences are on the cusp of a major new turning point when it comes to engagement and impact with this relatively newly available data. And I hope our, through our panel today, you'll be inspired by the opportunities that our panelists will outline, um, and, but that we'll also have a good discussion about some of the challenges facing researchers today. And can we, I'm really keen to just get a better sense of who everyone is here, because um, we, we don't know, it's a mystery to us. So can you just sort of raise your hand if you're an academic researcher, give us a flavour. And if you're a student at a university, fabulous. Do you, who works for organisations connected in, with higher education? And is there an other box of people? Yeah, Okay. Fabulous. Okay, so you've all got a sense of who you all are now, and um, so do we, so that's fantastic. I realise I, I didn't introduce myself, but I'm Martha Sedgwick. I work at SAGE, um, Executive Director of Product Management at SAGE, um, and really interested, to, excited about some of the new research that's emerging in the social sciences as a result of these vast data sets, and, and keen to explore what ways we, we as a publisher could support um, uh, development of skills and publication of this new type of research. So we'll be speaking um, throughout the next um, hour with a number of different uh, with presentations from us all, and then I hope we'll have about 15-20 minutes at least for discussion at the end before drinks and further discussion and hopefully debate. So please do save up lots of good questions to encourage a, a, a great discussion for us at the end of the presentations. And don't forget, um, help us create more data um, by using the Twitter channels and the hashtags that um, are up here. Maybe a future social scientist looking at the emergence of computational social science or social data science will um, find, a, uh, find value in, in the tweets you'll produce this evening. Okay. So I will just, um, I wanted to kick us off today with just a summary of some of the results from a survey that we did over the summer at SAGE. 
um, asking social scientists about their research and engagement with um, big data, trying to get a better understanding of how, of how many people, who was involved with, in big data research, who wants to be but isn't, and, and for those people teaching um, new skills to support big data research, what challenges they were finding in the field. Over 9,400 um, social scientists completed the survey, 33% of whom said they were involved in big data research. Of those doing it, about 79% um, said that they've collaborated with other researchers um, on their research and uh, reasonably um, striking in a context where about 40% of social science papers are sing uh, single authored. The survey indicated sort of in other places as well the sort of importance and um, prominence of interdisciplinary collaborations in this new area, especially um, sh um, showcasing new collaborations emerging between social scientists and um, academics and computer science faculties. And we're seeing sort of research labs emerging, particularly in institutions in the US as well, that provide sort of framework and environment to bring these different um, groups of academics together to provide those complementary skills. Of those um, academics who responded to the survey who are not currently doing big data research, about 3,000 of, 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 of that proportion said they were planning on doing so in the future. And so we can see a real sort of movement and a shift in, in this space. We asked um, academics what kinds of big data they're using. Um, the largest portion um, have replied saying they're using administrative data and Sharon's going to be talking a little bit more about um, that, that form of data that's available and how that's being used. The second most common was social media data and we'll be hearing a lot more from um, Luke and Mark today about their research um, engaging with social media data and the third was com use of, sort of commercial and proprietary data. We've got more um, information on further data sources on that chart. We asked um, what challenges were facing big data researchers. Funding um, is top of that um, chart, although it's unclear whether this is particularly um, uh, uh, um, uh, an issue for big data researchers over social science researchers more generally. <coughs> Access to data came up as the next um, biggest challenge facing big data researchers, and we'll be. Um, and I think that would be interesting to revisit in light of some of the presentations that we'll hear today. Then the, the, the other, the next two um, challenges highlighted were around learning new software and programming skills, and learning new methods. We asked what challenges fa were faced by researchers who were looking to engage with big data, um, but not doing so yet. Number one, the top of the list came finding, the, the challenge around finding collaborators with the right skills and knowledge to support the social scientists responding to the survey. Um, so then taking time and building new skills, understanding new methods and software. 40% of uh, respondents who answered that question said they'd like to attend a big data training session in the future and that we're, we're asking for courses on big data analytics, on data science, as well as text mining, R and Python. Also interesting here was that over 50% of respondents up to this question indicated that big, that, that, that big data being recognised or used in their field was something of a problem. And one respondent who um, was doing conducting big data research said, and I quote, I would like to emphasise the difficulty in finding journals that are interested and willing to publish interdisciplinary research. Several of the top journals in the business school disciplines have not yet embraced big data analytics. The results in this next slide show some of the challenges faced by uh, uh, those trying to teach big data. And here um, we can see um, the dominant theme is around skills. So students not having appropriate programming skills and, or, and knowledge or statistical knowledge coming in to these courses. Despite the potential that um, these new data have to deliver insights into individuals, groups and societies, it's um, not easy and we are sort of, you know, the, the beginning of the forward end of the, of the emergence of this new field of computational social science or social data science. With this sort of summary here, I just aim to, to summarise some of the hurdles that we at SAGE are hearing is, are emerging, ooh, I'm online, through... Um, 
through, oh, oh it's Katie, <laughs> through um, the research that we've been doing. And some of those I've talked through already, but I just thought it would be useful to recap and for you to think about as we listen to the rest of the panellists and we think about um, questions for the discussion afterwards. So the first being around access to data, the second being around ethical use of that data, the third being around skills and, and new skills required for both researchers and students, Fourth around software that can be used to collect and analyze these data. Interdisciplinary collaborations, particularly um, uh, both within the social sciences and out to um, computer science and other science disciplines. And then finally, how and where to publish. For anyone interested to read more about the results of the survey, we've written a white paper which is available on the um, tables just outside. Um, and I just wanted to share some other resources from Sage that are available for you um, if you if you want to sort of dig deeper into some um, useful resources here. So we we see the potential I think at Sage sort of offered by this new approach approach to research as huge. But, um, but the challenges are too, and I hope that um, we'll d dive into that more and um, enrich the debate through the panellists that you'll hear um, speaking um, next, and um, let's come back for some questions afterwards. So that's it for me, and I will hand over to Sharon. Well, thank you, and uh, I don't have any PowerPoints because I really want first to set the scene and have us stand uh, back a bit, but I do want to thank SAGE in particular, not just for tonight, uh, but for its really strategic approach to this issue. I mean, a really profound engagement of social science with a set of issues, be they conceptual, methodological, or ethical, that we all as a community need to engage with. And I don't want to stand back and say, what is big data? I mean, I think there's a kind of Wikipedia-type definition, and then different people use it in different ways. But I want to draw attention particularly to all the data that involves volume, velocity, you know, it's speed or it's collected as part of something else, and the variation, it's unstructured. I don't, I think what's really important is to get the, to be very clear that big data is not always, and in fact, for social science purposes, not usually open data. It's not aggregate late. I mean, it may be aggregate level data, but a lot of the use comes when it is data about individuals. It's just not identifiable. Um, and I'll talk a bit about what that may mean in a second. Uh, what I thought I'd do is go through some of the challenges and some of the things we as a community need to think about now. And some of those are frustrating and difficult. And some of them are opportunities, and particularly in the light of all the news we've had uh, over the last 24 hours, I thought it would be good to end on a slightly optimistic note. So, so first, I mean, there's no question we have a what I now call a number and data skills gap. Uh, it's, it's, it's a whole range of things, ranging from facility with numbers. Uh, it can be statistics in the classical statistical sense. It can be algorithms. It can be any facility with numbers. But it's also data handling. And I don't just mean coding. I mean thinking about how you may structure data. And I'm proud to have been involved in the development of the QSTEP program. And my former colleague, Sarah Locke, from the Nuffield Foundation is here, and the uh, foundation is taking that forward, funding 15 centers with various disciplines, and Luke is at one of them, to, to take this skills forward. And it involves hiring new staff, because actually we do need more staff with the skills, but it also means teaching. But that's not nearly enough. You know, we're seeing yet another government review of number skills at secondary school level, temptations for government always to think that it's just one magic curriculum that will solve the problem when they A, know they don't have the teachers, but B, we've got to stop thinking about this as a zero-sum game. We need more numbers and social science A-levels, more data. We need different maths and statistics pathways. We've worked with the British Academy and others to protest the decision to 
cancel the new statistics A level, which was all about number and data. So that's a shortfall, and we all know it, and it needs to be tackled much more systematically. If anyone's interested, Adrian Smith should be publishing his review at the end of the year, and it's really important that we social scientists say this isn't just a STEM subject. It's not just producing more biologists and physicists and so on. It is important for our disciplines too. But it's kind of too easy to say it's just the social scientists who need these skills. So I think it's also important that we have ways of engaging with people that do have these deeper analytic skills who aren't social scientists, but get them to understand what taking social science questions seriously means. Because it is different just doing an app that will help us all travel better, and I certainly use about three or four of them, and they are brilliant. But it doesn't really take the understanding of social science. It's an inductive procedure. You're observing patterns of behavior, and you're giving notification, and then depending on the fact that individuals will do things. A lot of what we as social sciences or scientists are interested in are about looking at questions more deeply, looking at really uh, questions of individual behavior change and the effect of social context and environment, not just descriptively, but often to say, well, what interventions, which may not be data interventions, what interventions could we use that would change behavior? So the Academy for Social Sciences is currently doing a report on behavior change in public health. And there are lots of signs that, you know, apps and so on can be very helpful, but they almost never work very well alone. They need to be embedded in various social processes. So we need to work with people with those deeper data analytic skills, but who learn to take the social science issue seriously. And any of us who have funded this sort of work or worked as part of these teams know those interactions don't just happen with a few quick conversations and then Bob's your uncle, everybody's parceled up their work and they're doing what they want to do. You need more team-based work, and that, I think, was part of the Gary King uh, quote that you showed in the, in the invite. You need longer-term working together. You need accumulation and iteration, and I think, to my mind, it's one reason why institutions like the Institute for Fiscal Studies has you know, made such good moves in this area. It's not just that they're uh, number-driven economists. It's that they have a, a structure where they work together over time. And that's going to raise some questions about how do we fund the capacity development, but also the work itself. So it's not coincidental that both Luke and, and Mark are actually working in centers, and you need an investment for that. I think the new REF may even help some of that strategic thinking. So th those are two sorts of barriers. A, th a third barrier, and to my mind, a really underestimated one, is access to data. And it may surprise you to say underestimated, since you can hardly get two people in a room together who are using data, who don't spend a lot of time grumbling about the difficulties of it. Um, but it is a real problem, and particularly if it is individual data one is after. So for my sins, I am deputy chair of the Administrative Data Research Network Board, which you know is based on a huge consultation. There are no legal barriers. There are full safeguards uh, in the form of the, quote, five safes, good, you know, high-level data security, researcher covenants, so researchers sign up to certain behavior standards and their sanctions if they don't follow them, projects that have been assessed not just by social scientists but by lay people to say they offer public benefit, so the kind of quid pro quo, the social contract is if we're going to use these public data, we should make sure it's not just social scientists who gets to say, get to say this is useful because we all have an interest in using that data and that, are, that you th have standards for what kind of outputs you produce to reduce identifiability and so on and that you have a concept of safe data. You don't just grab everything and put it together. You think about what you need before you pull it together. Now, Administrative data has a particularly important role in a lot of what social science needs to look at. It has, it's collected routinely by government for its own workings. It's therefore not full of the response bias, the selection bias, the attrition that you would get. I'm not saying it's perfect, all data have noise, uh, but it, it's, it's comprehensive. And it has particular power when we can link it to survey-based data where we have deep information about uh, things. So surveys like the cohort studies 
or surveys about people who have a rare health condition or when we're, uh, people who've experienced certain things in schooling. And the current problem is even when those survey respondents give individual consent, government is very reluctant to release data. And part of it is they're worried about confidentiality and they're worried about examples, but a lot of it is to do with what it exposes about outcomes and accountability for government. And I want to just spend two minutes on that. We need as a community to engage much less defensively and much more actively in discussions that you can have access to de-identified data, what I think Welcome, uh, the Wellcome Trust is now going to be recommending we call depersonalized data. So we know it's not anonymous in the sense that if you combined enough of it, you could identify some rare categories. But it's de-identified, so that is very hard, and these other safeguards come into play. And it's got to be appropriate that you know, taking those ethical safeguards seriously, something the social sciences have actually been better than the health sciences at doing for at least 20 years. And therefore have led the formation of the standards in the administrative data sharing world. And that's now part of a bill that's going through Parliament, the Digital Economy Bill. But because using these data allows us to say, do these policies have their outcome? Do these uh, findings that we have show that perhaps um, the evidence that's been presented in Parliament or something isn't full or doesn't take account of things or is partial because evidence is almost always partial. It actually imposes a really helpful scrutiny function on policy, practice, and so on. And commercial data has other issues of access with commercial sensitivity, and many people get around it by having a time lag, so it's kind of less sensitive. But you can go through the same discussions and again, my understanding from the funding the ESRC is doing is that there's still a reluctance, even though commercial users, because of cookies and so on, can actually harvest huge ranges of evidence with what you wouldn't call as informed consent. You know, if you want to buy something or you want to do something, you really have to sign up to the cookies. So, so there's an issue here about thinking about social forms of consent. It's not, it's very clear that if it's your data about you and it's going to go with your identifiable things, there's a serious need for individual consent. But the point about us talking about these safeguards and so on, it isn't just an issue of data security and, let, and preventing hackers. It's very much an issue of saying, we have set up lay assessment. Does this offer public benefit? Is it a good trade-off if we're using data that are going to be linked to an individual data? And that taking that public benefit test seriously allows us to say we have a social consent, but it's partly because we're doing it in a public benefit for public benefit. It is producing outcomes that are helpful to people, knowledge that's helpful to people, and one part of it with administrative data is holding government to account. And so far, we've not won that battle. The legal uh, impediments aren't really the issue. It's reluctance on the part of government. So there will be increasing discussion of this over the next couple of years with the Digital Economy Bill. And as a community, we need to engage in that. There are pieces of work done by the ESRC and welcome, both carried out by Ipsos Mori about what the public thinks. Again, I can give the links to... Um, to Sage, and we can circulate that. But I think it's a really important debate for us to be active citizens in. So those are all the barriers. But I want to end by saying I do think one of the hugely exciting potentials of these sorts of data is they really fundamentally change some of our notions of what social science is. Now, I want to be clear, I'm not saying big data or even data are the only kinds of social science. The more pluralism, the better. But we do need more work using these kind of data. They're universal, they're representative, they allow us to collect information, perhaps most profoundly, that affect how we think about how society matters. What does social structure mean? Big data can illuminate the relationship patterns that are actually revealing social structures. 
So if you remember debates about uh, juvenile crime and broken windows theses and the characteristics of neighborhoods people lived in and the laborious months and months of coding, you know, these features versus using all kinds of data from local government about repairs and whatever to say, we've got lots of data and we can do it not just for one community. We can get a sense of what investments would actually change, make people feel safer and so on. So there's a, there's a set of issues that say, you know, relationships are social structure and we can actually look at that, the physical environment and the effect that it has on all of our behaviors and even culture, and I think we'll certainly hear one presentation today that says culture insofar as it's about meaning systems, we actually can get a sense of really quite big questions, but questions that we've only really thought about abstractly rather than empirically about, well, is this culture or is this social structure? We can set up some, some examinations of that and, and have really thoughtful social science. So it changes theoretically and it changes empirically some of the questions we might ask, and I'd welcome this. I also think, though, that it behooves us. It's going to mean that we have to think differently or more carefully about inductive work when we're quite usefully jamming a lot of stuff together and looking for patterns versus when we're actually saying, we got a question, we got an answer, and an inductive answer is not right. And that means all of us have to be smarter methodologically. Again, I'm not, uh, and I don't think many social scientists anymore are, saying you either do one or the other or, you know, one is right and one is wrong. I mean, in, in my day, we often taught that. But I do think it's important that we engage seriously with those methodological questions as well as the substantive ones. But those substantive questions actually give us a chance to say social science isn't just about individual behavior. It is about the social and cultural world we live in. And from that point of view, it's going to be worth all the fight about access and so on if we can open up that bag full of questions. So that's all I want to say. Leading on from that, I'm going to talk about social structures. I'm going to talk about Twitter data. I'm going to talk about how we can understand the social world through Twitter data, through case studies, three case studies, one of which I wrote two hours ago, which is now on the US presidential election. Um, and I want to show the differences that manifest on Twitter through gender and location in a range of different contexts. Okay? So my research has fundamentally been about understanding how can this one particular source of big data, Twitter, help us understand the social world, help us investigate the social world. And I'll say at the very start, this is not about replacing traditional modes of social science. This is about augmentation. This is about something that tells us something slightly different. To the social world. It tells us, it gives us naturally occurring data, it gives us data that hasn't been subject to a measurement effect, but it also gives us lots of noise. And what Sharon said there about inductive deductive, how do we deal with big data, Twitter data, such voluminous data when we have a research question rather than just looking for pattern matching? I mean, invariably we'll find something because we always find something when you're looking through millions and millions of cases. And when we're talking big data, we are talking huge. I collected all tweets this morning, I woke up, got out of bed, wish I hadn't. Started collecting Twitter data with any term containing Trump. Within 10 minutes, I had a quarter of a million tweets. Okay, that's how big it was, trending. And the chances are there were more than that, because if it exceeds a certain percentage of traffic, I would have been very limited. Okay, so how then to use that data in a useful way? I'm going to show you something which I think is quite telling. Also linking back to the thing about broken windows, one of the projects we've done with crime sensing is trying to understand if tweets that contain terms of low-level disorder actually correlate in areas of high crime, okay? controlling for economic deprivation through census data. So again, using Twitter data is about often um, cross-referencing with other sources to see what in addition can it tell us about an area. If we're trying to predict crime rates for an area, we have past crime rates, we have census area measures, does Twitter add to our explanatory ability to explain crime rates? Okay, Fab. So quick context, Twitter data. It's naturally occurring. It's current and timely. The case study on the US presidential election is particularly timely. It has extreme temporal and geographical granularity. So when a tweet is made, you have the timestamp to the minute, to the second. And that's incredible. That can tell us instant reactions to real world events. Some tweets, up to around 2% of global traffic, are geotagged, which means we know the latitude and longitude of the person. So we know this person is saying they're not feeling safe walking through an area. We know where they are. 
And because geography is the key, we link, link that to census data, crime rates, and so on and so forth. So for that 2% of tweets that are geotagged, which is still a lot of traffic when you consider how much Twitter data there is, it's incredibly useful for locating people within a context. It addresses the criticism of Twitter data that it is um, decontextualized. When we know where someone is, we know something more about them. Okay. Anybody can collect Twitter data, up to 1% for free. Um, I'm part of a team that helped create a piece of software called Cosmos, a collaborative online social media observatory, which removes the technical barriers for collecting Twitter data. So it's all a visual interface. It's available free to um, academics, government, and non-profit institutions. We can have a talk afterwards about how you would gain access to it. And everything I've done has been either on Cosmos or down, um, you'll see the visual interface in a minute, and a little bit on SPSS to get some nice line graphs. So I do three case studies. Talk about the Boston Marathon bombing as an example of anomaly detection. So how social media can help us to respond very quickly to crisis events. We talk about what was the London 2012 Olympics, which is now the US presidential election. I want to look at some of the differences between gender and sentiment online. Um, I was kind of lucky. I had this research question that I thought men and women would be using different types of language. So, you know, a priori, that was my theory. I tested it. And luckily I was right, because it was about an hour before this talk. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to do that. And then I want to talk about Ebola. So I was collecting some data on the Ebola crisis back when it was at its peak. And there's some really interesting differences in the sort of discourse coming from the Western world and the African world. Okay, and we can start to unpick some of these things and see what it tells us that we wouldn't normally be able to get. And actually, that's what I want you to think about, this whole thing. What is this telling me as an individual, as an academic, as an observer, as a member of the public? What is this telling me that I wouldn't have been able to find out through standard methods of um, social research? So what we have here is um, a, a snapshot of the Boston Marathon. We have three information pages. On the left, we have the geotag tweets at the top left. And then the word cloud is off the key terms. The bigger the word, the more frequent it is. And on the right, we have um, a kind of frequency analysis. So it's showing us how many tweets are happening by the day, by the hour, and by the minute. And there we're about um, between 1 and um, 5 o'clock um, beneath GMT. And you can just see at the top left that there are a row of points which are all coloured yellow. Those are the ones that were made in that one hour slot. And they map very nicely onto the Boston Marathon route. Of course, we all know what happened in the Boston Marathon, and we can see here this sudden massive spike in tweets is indicative of the bombing. And what happens is all of a sudden, the top left, the, the radius of people tweeting about the Boston Marathon expands beyond the route. The discourse, the words completely change, and there's a massive spike in Twitter traffic around it. Okay. Now, if I were monitoring Boston Marathon using social media, this might be the first sign I would have that something's gone wrong. And it would give me some pretty accurate information as to where it's gone wrong as well. And there's evidence of Twitter being used by um, Axel Bruns at um, Queensland, did some stuff around flood response. Um, I've done some work with the Food Standards Agency on understanding food scares and sort of how information disseminate rockets through networks. And there's work also done on being able to track the epicenter of an earthquake by working backwards on the Twitter track. Someone tweets there's been a tremor, 10 miles away there's been a tremor, and you can follow it back quite closely to where it started. Okay. So Twitter as a monitoring tool is very useful. This idea that um, humans have agency and they are sensors to things going on around them. Now the US presidential election race, what I have here is a word cloud. I collected data between probably nine, what was it, about quarter to nine and quarter past nine GMT this morning. So when I woke up, I was like I drag myself out of bed to face it and get up and realize that the data collection is probably the silver lining of what has ever been a horrific event. What we have here is a word cloud. I've removed the words Donald and Trump because they were massive. And what you can see there is the sort of thing people are talking about. Now, I went into a little bit more detail. There's lots of French in this, there's lots of Spanish in this, and lots of Portuguese language as well. So one of the things Cosmos does is it automatically detects the language of the tweet. Actually, so it's not just English, and that would make sense. French, Canada, Mexico, Latino community, Portuguese, I guess Brazil, I don't know, proximity, and so on and so forth. And you can see the sorts of things that are merging. Um, the fact that there are swear words on there that are that big. I mean, this accounts for about 80,000 of the tweets, I think, that's how many people are using those words. Okay. Also, white, uh, Putin, Brexit, so on and so forth, hate, 
it's all quite horrible. And actually, if you remove some more terms, because the really big terms swarm all the others, you start to see some interesting things coming through. And this is just from half an hour of data. What you could do is collect this over time and then map the trends and almost have a visualization where it's going to change for every hour. And you'll be able to map it into what's really going on in the world. Okay. Now, that was for interest to see what was going on. Oh, oh, oh no. What I found particularly interesting, he says, not pressing the end button, was the difference between the way men and women are expressing themselves on Twitter. Okay, so we have a way of detecting male or female gender. It's an algorithm. I can explain it afterwards if you want. Um, the fact that the difference is so stark suggests the algorithm is picking up something real. So effectively, what we have here is time, by the minute, from the yeah, quarter to eight, quarter past nine in the morning, and then sentiment score. So the sentiment score takes a load of words, works out as negative or positive, and spits out a response. It's coarse. But again, the fact that there's such a big difference between men and females suggests something. It suggests that women are always, always more negative in their use of language, or use more negative language in tweets containing the word Trump during this time period than men. <laughs> Which is kind of reinforcing what you would have expected, but it didn't manifest in the election result. Um, and I didn't have time to look at this before the event, but I'm sure these. The big dip for women there would be associated with some event. Maybe it's when we stood up and talked, or it's when someone made a new event or Fox News said something. You can tie these real world events to the minute. And that temporal granularity is so powerful because you can start to move towards. I, I want to go beyond correlation. I don't quite want to go to causation. But when you can tie things that closely together, this happened and then this happened on Twitter related to the topic, you can start to tell a story and look at the relation between the real world and the virtual. And actually, when you, when you do a statistical test to map the distribution of sentiment between men and women and man, women, you find that it's highly significant. Highly significant. There's no doubt that there's a true difference in sentiment. Okay. I want to move quickly on to Ebola. So this is about crisis response. This is also about understanding not just gender, but differences in geography. So this data was collected during the peak of the crisis. There's a few things going on here. Starting with gender, we have networks. So one thing this process will do is draw a network of who's retweeting who. And what you find when you split between male and female tweeters is that the networks look different. It's this idea of structures, this idea that um, gender carries through to the virtual world, even though we have a chance to reshape our identities of it, is demonstrated by the fact that Lucky Tor, no idea, is key center except in the male network. In the female network, this person doesn't exist, but UNICEF as a few other people. So there are network structural differences in the way that people mention and retweet each other as a function of gender. That in itself is interesting. There are slight differences in the language used, but not much. And this is largely due to the fact that a lot of the practice to retweeting is not duplication. What is more interesting is when you look at the geographical differences. So what we have here are the tweets that were um, geotagged. And the variant box is a bit out of line actually before that change. But I say it's all the tweets from North America and decide to compare them to all the tweets from Africa. And then look at the language differences. And it's very stark. Oh, it's satellite image. On the left, we have the North American word clouds. On the right, we have Africa. Okay. Now you can see for yourselves the difference. I'm going to talk very generally, I'm not a physical analyst, but fear and news. Okay, so what we have here is a reaction, reaction to fear, reaction to become infected, and pandemic and so on and so forth. What we have in Africa is almost um, aid agencies, almost information transition. You know, it's all about um, locations, it's all about times, vaccines, trials, updates, cases, so on and so forth. So, on the one hand, we could say they talk about very different things. On the other, we can say social media is serving a different purpose, depending on where it's located job, geographically. It's, um, it's a public forum, if you like, in North America. Voice of fear. It's in Africa, it's about information, it's about dissemination, it's about getting things out of the time. There's also questions about who can access social media, who's tweeting in Africa, is it aid workers? Quite probably, what's the technological infrastructure? Does the average person who's like to be um, contracted by going to have a phone? Maybe, maybe not, so their voice is missing. And that leads on to my later questions about worry questions, and we have to be very um, upfront about the fact that which is not a random sample. Certain groups are not represented. 
Some groups are represented, but typically are underrepresented on social service. That makes it useful, but it's not population data. It's not a random sample of population data. And we always have to bear that in mind as reflexive social scientists. Now, one of the interesting things you can do is plot um, gender. So on here, sorry for pink and blue, it's just I always have to explain this so fast. It's easy to use this. So the blue spots represent male tweeters, and the pink spots represent female, or at least how these people have chosen to um, represent themselves online. And you can colour the, you can size the points by sentiment. Okay, so that's just an example of a tool. It doesn't tell us much, and this is one of the problems with the data and the noise. So, okay, yeah, really interesting. That's really cool. You know, this is sort of pattern recognition. This is, this is a typical engineering discussion. We can do it. We can make this, so we will. The question is, well, what does that tell me? Not much, actually. I don't know if anybody else can see anything there, but I can't really tell the story. Of course, the point of, the point of this, the point of social science is not that you test a hypothesis, but then when you find something to be the case, you can find a substantive explanation for why it should be. That's part of the validity of reliability. And in this case, that doesn't really tell me anything that I can hook onto the real world. Okay. Fab. So very quickly, I want to go on to the worry questions. It's obvious that social media tells us something different. Traditional modes of social research. Um, but not everybody's represented. It differs very much by age. Okay, so there's an age demographic someone work between probably 15 to mid 20s who are predominantly the tweeters, and there's a really long tail towards the um, upper end of the age spectrum, which is way out of line with the, um, the age distribution of the UK population. However, one percent of people above the age of 50, one percent of Twitter users, millions of Twitter users, that's still a lot of people. That's still a lot more people when we get through a social survey, so it could still be useful. Um, there's issues around sentiment constructed as through bag of words, trigrams, bigrams, methods. So what actually is sentiment? That's a very good question. What are we missing geographically? Who's not using Twitter? People in China don't use Twitter. They need to sign away, but they use other platforms. Okay. Is, does the technological infrastructure exist in places? We find things like um, uh, there's a Different, there's a differential between whether people geotag or not based on their country. So people in Russia are much less likely to have geotagging switched on, i.e. lap long identification, than people in most of Western Europe. Understandably, perhaps. Okay. And then there's a the question of how do people use Twitter. There's a question of, um, is it professional, is it personal, is it organisational? Do people have multiple accounts, do people count people twice, do people use it to troll? Do people um, pretend to be a different gender or age or misdirection through their occupation? Why are they using Twitter to promote themselves as a news transmission, to retweet, to produce original content? All these things have yet to be resolved. But I think the point is, when I started this three or four years ago, we didn't even know, we, this could have been a dead end, I could have wasted four years of my life. I think we're now at the stage, we're saying there is something useful in this, but we've still got to work out what. Thank you. I'm going to take a slightly more radical um, I think we've been sort of being very nice about how we're all going to get along, and I think that's true. Um, but I, I want to tell a little story. Um, so let me start by saying, um, if you recognize this and know what it would be called, raise your hand. <laughs> so that, I'll count that as a raised hand. Uh, so not many people raising hands. Okay, this is in fact, Sharon. It's, yeah, um, it's a slide rule, okay? So this is a computational aid. It has logarithmic scales on it, and you know, if you remember back, in case you're not a quanti sort of person, um, if you want to multiply two logarithms, uh, two numbers, you take the log and add them. So you can slide this along and look and you know, do, do quite a few computations very quickly. Turns out for about 350 years, this was an indispensable tool of science and engineering, and then it just disappeared to the point where we don't even know what the hell this thing is. Uh, that is what people in business, and I, I'm in a business school, so this is interesting to me, thinking about innovation. That's what people in business call a disruption. It's something, it's like a sneak attack. It's a sort of a surprise social change that happens very quickly because a substitution effect between two different things that look very different are sold to different people, are called different things. They don't have a similar technological basis at all. Um, 
and they're, they're categorized differently. So our sociocog sociocognitive frameworks for thinking about these things are kind of non-overlapping for a long time until that substitution effect becomes apparent. And then all hell breaks loose, and you get basically a die-off. So this is the radical support point of view that, I'm, that, I'm, that I've got here. That the use of data and social sciences is poised to create that kind of die-off for us. There will always be the historical sort of thing, and there will be the old school, you know, people that are doing whatever they do, but we're poised for a change. So let me tell you a story of this in my field. Um, I'm a cultural and um, organizational sociologist, and about a generation ago, a new set of tools came along, which was basically from bioinformatics. We used survival models to do kind of event history analysis and figure out when things happen or when the rate of things is more likely to go up, and we're able to sort of make some uh, you know, general statements about that when you have population data sets. And so it was possible to take whole organizational populations, kind of code them up for this sort of thing, and say, what can we say about founding and birth rates and, and social change? And, and oh my goodness, that came along and changed the kind of research that was done to instead of it being like, well, how you build an organization is you sort of have this rationalistic model about what makes for a smart organization and it's kind of like an engineering puzzle and problem. And this whole cultural kind of milieu enter, entered into the conversation. Actually, organizations that are founded in a certain era, uh, they tend not to change. And if you're, if you're not founded in that era, then you're going to probably look very different. And there are all these things that didn't fit the model. So the point is that the new kind of technologies or tools that came along, disruptions, sort of like the, the thing that killed this off, really changed not just the methods that people were using, but the way that we theorize about this stuff. And so that's what's the power of this, is we're not just talking about being nerdier and smartier, but new lenses for understanding problems that make us better at explaining things. So that you know what was before just an error term gets unpacked, and it actually gives us a very different way of understanding what we're looking at. Um, so I've got a couple of slides to show you um, an example of, of the sort of work that we're doing. Um, this is, this is one where we're looking at uh, tweets that have Brexit hashtag in it um, and just thinking about what's the volume based on the classification of the position. So we're using some machine learning to go through the content of the tweet and say, does this look like it's more of a lead tweet or more of a remaining tweet? And, you know, even if you don't have fully calibrated eyeballs, you can sort of tell that the lead bars are higher than the uh, so very simple, just just volume. Uh, but uh, and and I cut off the data that we have after the vote because it's a little bit misleading. We've got a couple of blank days in there from the technical glitch that we're working our way through. But then the remaining side goes crazy, and the the, the lead side sort of stays about where it was. So basically, a whole bunch of people that were fairly complacent woke up and smelled the coffee and started tweeting like crazy uh, about what had just happened. So that, that was a bit of a surprise. Um, this is a different sort of look at this. Um, this is from 33 million tweets that go from January to July 2016. And this is a subset of that data that's the last 5 million, which, which corresponds roughly to June. And what we have here is the scoring for whether these tweets are more likely to be lead, more likely to be remain, and then we actually sort of dip these things. And what you see is that we're kind of unclear about a, a whole bunch of them, but the ones that are more likely to lead, we've got a higher density in that box than the ones that are more likely to remain. And so that's telling us a couple of things. Not only is there just more engagement in terms of activity, but a lot in the way that Luke was showing is there's also just more passion in what people are saying. It's more definitely classifiable as one or the other. So this is, this is the sort of thing that tells us, here's an example of, of a sneak attack surprise social change that people didn't really see coming. It's not exactly that sort of technology disruption like something like this, but it's even worse. Here, there's at least an artifact that's being displaced by another artifact. In the case of Brexit, in the case of what's happening in the US right now, it's just an idea. It's circulating around, it's in words, it's an abstraction. 
Um, it's really hard to get your arms around that because we can't measure SKUs going through Walmart distribution centers or being sold, you know, wherever it is and say, oh, now we know this thing is changing. Except for we can do this actually with what people talk about. So if you think about the dynamics of social structures and how they change, you know, we can measure things like we have done in, in prior years, and we kind of, I would say, have medium-sized data sets, maybe not big-sized data sets, about all of that. Oops, sorry. Um, but then we can also measure the volume of talk that we have about these things. And, and what's really cool about that is it gives us a window into what people are thinking about social structures before it becomes evident that, that big changes have happened. If you consider, for example, um, in, in the United States and Britain and many countries around the world, in the last generation, in the last decade, there have been a number of landmark rulings about changing how we think about, for example, a very basic social institution like marriage. And there are people who, who, who looked at these sudden changes with sentiment, sent, sentinel rulings that were made and said, oh, it just changed. No, it changed a long time ago. It's been changing for a long time. And that's evident when you do this sort of analysis because you see the way that people are thinking in what we talk. And it's possible to do analyses where you have dynamic graphs that you look at the relations among different elements of a concept and sort of look at how they're changing and can become very good at predicting um, how all of that's likely to, to fall out. Um, let me tell you a story about a kind of re-theorization that's coming out of doing this sort of work. So um, another picture that I can't show you because it's only right now visualizable in our data observatory at Imperial, which is 64 46 inch monitors in this sort of, uh, you know, bat cave kind of configuration where you go in and um, it's very immersive. It's quite cool, actually. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, so what it shows is that the engagement and the polarity of the content of tweets for the leavers was initially more powerful than the polarity of the tweets for remainers. And this continues for a little while. Um, and during this time, what happened in real life is that leavers were saying, you know what? Um, we're going to be economically better off if we leave. And remainers were saying, what? Do you know nothing about economics? And they mounted a critique of that argument. Now, it was pretty effective. And so at that point, then the leavers said, you probably should try a different argument. This one's not working. So at that point, they got just really intense and started saying basically crazy stuff, like 350 million per day, and you know, all people are going to take your lunch away, and they're going to kidnap your children. I mean, I know that wasn't really what it was, but it, it became very extreme. And at that point, this sort of critique argument that was like, no, this is not working very well. You guys are you guys are over exaggerating. It stopped working. So kind of there was a second round of the whole debate. And at that point, the remainers started just basically getting their asses kicked. And then you get into the final bit, and everybody's now being fairly kind of emotional, fairly engaged, fairly passionate. The re-theorization comes in in that we're sort of looking at this and seeing it as kind of like scissors, paper, stone. Round one, you know, the, the levers are saying, well, let's, let's play the... Uh, paper. Here's our white paper about how we're going to be better off uh, leaving. And then the remainers play scissors. Well, scissors cut paper. So there we go. Round one to them. Round two. Oh, that's not working. We need to stop with the paper and let's go with the rock. Let's just pound the crap out of people. Um, so we come as the remainers. We still have the paper. Oh, here's why that's not a nice way to play this debate. We should do it a different way, right? Okay. Uh, well, that didn't work. I'm sorry. Come with the scissors, I said. Um, that's, that's what it is. So the, the, the stone smashes the scissors, and round two goes to the levers. Round three, oh, no, this will never do. We both need rocks. But at that point, it's a stalemate. The momentum's the other way. And that's sort of how the whole thing goes. Now, is that right? We're working on it. We don't really know. But the point is that we're now thinking about the dynamics about this in totally different ways. And if you look at the US election, which was just concluded, what I think is really uh, you know, kind of uh, challenging about it is that previously we would have thought, well, you want to differentiate, you want to have your unique selling proposition, and you want to be good at fundraising, you want to be good at having an army of people who are going to do all the things, and it's about the machinations of campaigns. 
Well, there's a different hypothesis that says basically there's an issue landscape in every generation, in every big cycle. And fitness with that landscape is what's going to determine a lot of what happens. And I, I can't show this one to you either, but we have kind of a view of that landscape that suggests that this Make America Great Again was resonating with a core demographic that was enough to win on. And it, it's not just Make America Great, but it's the idea that there's a demographic that feels like they've lost something and feels like there's been a lot of inattention to their problems. That's the end of my time. Um, and the same thing happened to Brexit. So this basically tells us that we can start to theorize new ways of understanding the dynamics of, of changes in parties, changes in power, changes in regimes and what we think of by looking at these kinds of materials and kind of doing a really quirky, funky, fun kind of mashup of stuff that's very quantitative and very interpretive. And then from that, you can go out of the inductive stage into things that you can test. Um, so this is what I guess I would leave you with that these are things that are coming at, at, at us as social scientists. They're also happening in business and in, in, in policymaking circles. And there probably will be a kind of disruptive thing that happens on this. So that if you want to be like relevant, you at least want to be good at speaking the language of this so that you can translate across different kinds of research. Doesn't mean you need to do it, uh, but you might want to be able to talk to people.